Thank you for uh, joining us for the LCC Symposium Series. And uh, today we're just uh, honored and grateful to have a great partner from Wynn Resorts, Matt Maddox, CEO of Wynn Resorts. How are you today, sir? You know, uh, it, it's 2020, but uh, relatively speaking, I'm, you know, I'm doing great. And I appreciate you inviting me uh, to do this with you, Peter. Yeah, no, it's actually an honor to have you. Um, the Latin Chambers had a wonderful partnership uh, with Wynn Resorts for many, many years and, uh, and continues uh, today. So we're, we're just grateful that you uh, spending a few minutes with us and, and kind of talking about uh, what an uh, incredible year this has been and, and uh, all of that. But before we even get started, I want people to know um, a little more about you. Um, certainly, uh, I want them to understand that you, uh, I know you, so, and I know how intense you are. And um, I know you uh, go to sleep and wake up thinking about Wynn Resorts, your employees. Uh, you know, I want everybody to understand that as CEO, you have the weight of so many lives on your shoulders. You just do. It comes with the territory. And so how, how does that feel? And am I correct? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, y you're correct. The, um, you know, I would say that, uh, there's something that I, I call the dark side of ambition, right? And so you're right. There, there's always, anytime that you're in these positions, there's a lot of decisions you have to make that, you know, are going to impact people's lives. And so, you know, I've, uh, either positively or negatively. And so one of the things that we've really focused on here in the last three years since I've been CEO is integrating three pillars into our culture and every decision we make. It used to just be about the shareholders, right? But now it's not anymore. All my communication, everything I do, we talk about at when we're going to invest in our company and our people, that's our shareholders, in our families and in our community. And so every employees want to know that their employer really cares doesn't just talk about it but really cares really tries to make a difference and you know trying to balance those elements because oftentimes they're competing uh is is a challenge but it's it's one of the best parts of the job yeah and that's uh, so eloquently put together um you know i another thing i know about when resorts is how important uh, diversity amongst employees has been. And so I'd like to touch on that. Uh, you know, obviously Latino, Hispanic diversity, but diversity in general, uh, how important is that at Wynn Resorts? It's, you know, it, it's critically important um, for, you know, what I've found in my experience is um, when you have a lot of people, and I'm sure everyone knows this, but when you have a lot of people with very similar backgrounds, you all sit around and talk about an idea and it all sounds great because your point of view is all the same. And so I've experienced, and, and everybody believes it, right? And so I experienced this firsthand just starting with our board of directors when our board before was pretty much all uh, older, uh, wealthy white men. Um, that's what it was to, you know, in, in their 60s and 70s transitioning that to now our board of directors is at the independent board 50 percent female and you know we we just added a really strong superstar out of la um african-american and the conversations in our boardroom are so much richer now and it's it, it, and it really is not i mean our board members before were super smart right this isn't an intelligence thing it's the way you see the world and so just at the very top of our organization, by radically changing our board of directors, um, you know, I've experienced that firsthand. And then as you look at our organization itself, take Las Vegas, we're 70 percent minority in our workforce, 40 percent Hispanic, right? Um, about 30 percent uh, Caucasian and then about 10 percent African-American and then uh, 20 percent Asian. And then, you know, uh, goes from there. Um, and so we're incredibly diverse. Um, and uh, if you, but if you look at our executive team, where uh, our male female ratio, we're about a third minority and about a third female in US executives. Now that doesn't match. 
it's good, right? Relative to other benchmarks out there. But I've been really focused on how do how does the, the face of win from the top all the way to the bottom represent our customers and our employees. So, you know, one of the things that I put in just this year was when we're interviewing for director level and above positions, you have to have a diverse candidate. You don't have to pick a diverse candidate, but you have to have one. Because what I found is everyone goes back to the same pool. It's a small industry. We all know people. We all know our friends. We all, oh, well, this guy was great at MGM and this guy was great at Caesars, bring him over. It, it's really easy and people have a natural bias to pick people like themselves. They just do, right? And so we, I put that panel in place this year and what it does is it forces us to broaden our pool. It, it, and then you start learning about uh, seeing new candidates, new ideas, and it works. And it's already working. We're seeing we're seeing that work. So, this isn't like a, a you know a quick fix, a one size fits all. I just think you have to make it really part of your culture, invest in it, and you we will attract the best and the brightest, uh, which will include you know lots of diversity um, from around the country. And we're seeing that actually. Yeah, I tell you, uh, you hit it right on the nail when you said uh, the way you see the world, and uh, and that is uh, a reflection. And so it sounds like you guys are going through that now. And uh, that's, that's just incredible. That'll, uh, that'll certainly uh, change the way people see things like you mm -hmm. said at the boardroom all the way down. So I commend you for taking that kind of a commitment. You know, certainly, uh, certainly we, we, we are living through COVID. So, yeah. you know, how have you handled the COVID pandemic as a company and as a person? That, you know, this pandemic, uh, I had a little bit of a head start on it. If you go and you know read any of the press, because a lot of our business is out of China, and so when uh, and I actually lived in Hong Kong during SARS, which was a very localized epidemic wow. that was horrible in 2002, and a lot of my colleagues did. And so when I started talking to my colleagues in Macau about what was going on in China in December, this was back before. The U, like we were still having the Super Bowl and, you know, the U.S. thought this is not an issue. The fear in their voice was significantly more than what it was like during SARS. The um, people in, we had lots of employees from Wuhan and their family members were dying nonstop. And so I thought I better get ahead of this because I lived through SARS and this ain't SARS. So we went out and hired Dr. Rebecca Katz, which if yep. you see the news lately, uh, she's Joe Biden's advisor on his COVID task force. I went out and hired her in February as uh, to be my advisor. And she ran, uh, she runs all of Georgetown's global health and security issues and pandemic research. And so we began very early then hosting meetings with uh, the chief medical officers at the hospitals, with elected officials, with Rebecca and her team, and I got a group out of Silicon Valley every week to talk about here's what's coming. Here's what we see, here's what's coming. And so I really tried to step in and provide resource where there wasn't any. Um, we were the first to shut down in Las Vegas. Uh, we did it before the mandate because I, um, you know, it, it was the right thing to do. Uh, it was impossible to stay open. Uh, we were, because we kept, you know, Peter, all uh, 30,000 employees that we have, uh, about, you know, 12 in Vegas, uh, five and about 15 in North America and 15 in Macau, uh, thousand. We kept them all on during the closure. We spent a quarter of a billion dollars um, not furloughing people while we were closed. Our shareholders hated it. <laughs> hated it. And I explained to them, listen. There is one thing that I'm telling everybody in my company every day. No one remembers what happened in 2016. No one remembers what happened in 2013. But every person that's alive today will remember 2020. And you know what they're going to remember? How they were treated. And so this is our opportunity to remind people who we are, and we step in when times are tough and they are going to remember it. Our customers are going to remember it. Our employees are going to remember it. 
our elected officials are going to remember it. This is our moment to walk the walk. So yeah, shareholders aren't going to like it. It's going to cost a lot of money. So what? We've got to show who we are. And I promise there will be payback because no one's going to forget what we've all, you're not going to forget this year, right, Peter? I mean, no one's I mean, going to uh, I mean, my God, what you just said is so powerful. It gives me goosebumps and, and gets me actually emotional. What you just said is so powerful and speaks so volumes to the win way. That should be on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal, either now or at some time, because yeah. there are not so many companies thinking like that. And um, it's why I'm such an advocate, not only for Wynn Resorts, but for our hospitality and tourism industry so much, um, because we must support great companies like yours. Uh, this whole community needs to rally because these are hard times. And for you to even be thinking like that, um, I, I want the average person to understand that I am very sure shareholders were screaming and yelling at you about thinking that way. Yeah, they were, they were. And, and I, I will say this in full transparency, clearly after we've opened, right? We've had to make adjustments to staff to demand, right? We can't, but my, promise was while we're closed for those 90 days, you know, we are going to take care of everybody that's ever been here, uh, that's ever worked here. So, um, yeah, it's a fine balance. I mean, it's a yeah. fine balance. You can't be totally disrespectful to your shareholders because those exactly. are also people who believe yeah. in you and your company. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, I'd say I'm, I'm, on the COVID front, so we're, I'm trying to continue to anticipate how do we get Las Vegas back, right? And so Las Vegas is built around mass gatherings. It is, right. right? It's not built around casinos. Casinos are great. That's what's carrying us right now. But it's built around uh, shows and entertainment and conventions and nightclubs and people coming together to have fun. And what I've learned about our experience in China is since they're now moving in China and out and about and nightlife is back, people got really sick and tired of wearing their sweats and pajamas every day. And so we're, you know, during the lockdown, they really, once they got out and got the taste of being around other people, it's like electric. You've forgotten what you loved. And so I, I think that we need to be leading in this country to get people back together in a safe way because they're going to realize how much they missed it. We've got to get shows back again. We've got to get conventions back again. And I think people are going to want to dress up and go out and be around other people once they feel safe, right? I echo so that. what I think it's going to be similar to the Roaring Twenties after the pandemic of 1918 and 1919, right? You went into Great Gatsby. I mean, it was like, oh my yeah. God, we survived this. Let's get, let's have fun. Um, and so one thing we're doing is, you know, partnered with UMC and we're building our own lab here now that'll be finished in about 30 days. And it will be one of the best labs uh, for sure in the state. Um, and, you know, we'll be able to process between six and 8,000 COVID tests in about a six hour period. And these are PCR, meaning the gold standard test, right? Not the antibody. This is as good as it gets in terms of specificity and sensitivity. You know, 98 plus, 99 plus percent um, accurate. And so, uh, and my thought is this vaccine is going to roll out, which is going to be great. And we want to try to be able to provide that when we can after the first responders and the necessary people get it. But in order to get 5,000 people back in a nightclub or a big show or a convention, I'd like to have, okay, have you been vaccinated? Yes or no? Okay, no. Then take a test. All you have to do is spit in this tube and we're going to turn it around. And then if you're a green light, you're allowed to go in. And if you're a red light, you know, we have, we have a whole process for someone that's COVID positive and all of our employees do the same. So that, I just think that way until this is gone or there's herd immunity or massive vaccination, that I think that will make people feel much, much, much more comfortable getting into a space with more people knowing everybody in that room has tested negative within the last six hours. 
uh, or, uh, or eight hours or uh, has been vaccinated. And so that's, I think we'll be one of the first companies kind of in entertainment to do that. And I want to do that to try to be, get Las Vegas going again, to have some stuff to do. Yeah, so, what a wonderful investment. And, uh, and I know it's going to pay off for you, uh, no doubt about it. I'm just wondering with a company so large, how are you able to communicate with your employees during these challenging times? Because as you can imagine, and I, and I hear this a lot, um, cause I take those phone calls of, of the worry, you know, the worry from employees, how do you, how are you able to communicate as a company down to your employees or back yeah, to it, your employees? It, it's hard. We did, you know, from the beginning of COVID, we, we did, uh, a lot of video and we have, um, a system where we can text it out to everybody. So it's a really easy kind of click here and talk because we can't get people together in town in town halls, right? Right. Um, our property presidents do kind of a weekly update to everybody. We do daily pre-shifts to everybody. And, you know, one of the things that we did during the closure when it was so worrisome is we created teams where managers were responsible to call line level workers, dealers, housekeepers, et cetera, and engage with them. How are you doing? What's going on? And we created contests to, hey, when we reopen, what could we do better? How could we be more efficient? And to try to engage people, um, I actually took a list of all, uh, not, you know, thousands of line level employees and their phone numbers. And every day I would call 25. And I never knew, you know, I mean, because we have thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. And half the time, just to let people know this is everybody's, you know, in this together. Half the time, people would not recognize my number and text back. And, you know, half the time they'd think, oh, this isn't really you. But once we broke through those things, it was a very human moment, right? To just talk to people about how they're doing and what's going on. And sometimes I would catch people and they'd be in the middle of a real tragic situation. Yeah. And, um, and so we, we encouraged everybody to try to do that, to sort of drop the lines of, uh, you know, who reports to who and all that stuff and just kind of talk to people and check in on them. So it's not perfect, but it, it was different. It's definitely uh, not, it, nothing's ever perfect, but it's a great attempt and it sounds like you're doing the right things. I'm just curious because I know how important your foreign side of your business is to your bottom line. Uh, how has the pandemic affected your foreign business? Like we don't hear a lot about Macau right now. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it had a dramatic impact where, you know, we were losing lots of money there, a couple million dollars a day at, at the operating line. Um, and, you know, Macau pretty much quarantined itself. It shut down its borders and, uh, to become COVID free. And it did. They wow. haven't had, they haven't had a COVID case. Are you ready for this? They haven't had a case in Macau in 200 days. Wow not a case. So um, they're just now beginning to reopen the borders uh, from China. The only people that can go there are, are really from China right now. And so we're seeing in October, our visitation went up quite a bit. It's still not even close to what it used to be. But the government there is taking an extremely measured, thoughtful approach, kind of half step forward, half step forward, half step forward. Not never a step backwards. So, you know, in the US, we're a little more ragtag, right? We'll run forward four steps and then run backwards six. Um, they're, they're treating it differently there. It's uh, slow and steady, but it, each month over there, it's getting better, um, but just slowly. So we're, and that really just started in October. Do, are, are you fearful of a, another closure? <sighs> Well, I, you know, I think I hate to sit here and predict what the hell do I know, but I, I think that, you know, there's going to be pretty significant spread in December, right? I think we're kind of coming into this right now. Um, we're going to, you know, it, if history is an indication of the future, it starts in Europe, it rolls to some of the blue states, like super blue states, and 
and then it kind of creeps its way in, right? And we're seeing that now. So do I, I don't know if there will be a closure or not. Uh, do I expect more restrictions and significantly less people over the next two months? Yes, absolutely, right? So the only thing we can do is try to make sure that we provide a really safe environment and we do what we can. Right. That's it. That's if there is, do. that's it. If there is a closure, we'll close. Right. And it, it, it won't be for a long time. I would think it'd start like in Massachusetts, they put in a curfew. So everybody's got to be home at 10 period. So our casino in Massachusetts closes at nine 30. Right. So, you know, you could see curfews, you could see restrictions, you could see all types of things are going on. It's a really state by state case. We now have practice at this right so yep. it would be hard it'd be tough on people um but we know how to do it and we're again preparing for the worst and hoping that we just kind of get through it and again i i really think by the summer which feels like a long time away but it's not we'll be back conventions won't be back right that the business travel will take forever but the vaccine will be rolling out testing will be significantly will be widespread and sort of ubiquitous and people will be ready to be back with other people. And I think we'll start feeling that momentum in sort of February-ish, March, right? Coming out of the winter. And, you know, that's my, that's what I think. So I think between now and then, you know, bro bucking Bronco. I echo those thoughts with you. I'm, I'm thinking the same way and the same line. So, and I'm hearing from a lot of business people, they feel the same way. We just got to get over this hump. We yeah. Have to get over this hump, so. That's right. You know, in closing, I'm just curious, uh, what do you believe is the future of Win Las Vegas? What's the future? Uh, I, so I think that Las Vegas itself, because of our heavy reliance on conventions, is going to have a slow comeback. But on the flip side, I think we're smart enough and we're doing it to attract more leisure customers coming to have fun because I think people are really going to want to get out and have a good time. Yeah. So having the Raiders now and having T-Mobile and we're working on new shows and being able to launch a lot of that, I think we can make up not for all of it, but for a lot of that business. And I think Las Vegas can establish itself as sort of the place to go again quickly to let loose, right. To get together with friends you know, um, it's what we've always been, but I think I think that that will be our immediate future and something we can really lean into uh, to get us going again and get you know lots of people hired again and and moving. And my long term uh, view is Las Vegas is in a very good position. I think five. You know, we are we now have everything. Um, we are seeing people come here from lots of states. We're seeing diversification of our economy up north. Um, so I'm a big believer that the future of Las Vegas is quite bright um, as you know, but it'll take a couple years, uh, but it's, it's, it's quite bright. Well, I agree with you. I think that uh, the comeback may be a little slower than we all wish, but it's mm -hmm. gonna be huge. And for the exact reasons you said, we now have everything, we have sports, we have entertainment and we know how to put on a party. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know that this is a tough moment right now, but I want folks to understand it's going to be huge. We are yeah. going to be huge because we always are. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Matt, We're good at this. Matt, the Latin Chamber of Commerce appreciates its partnership with you. We always stand with you. We're always advocating for you guys. And I uh, just thank you. I'm so proud that we have, uh, at the helm of such a great company, uh, a good man like you, who's actually thinking about the community, the employees and the shareholders as a whole. So thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Peter, I appreciate it. And we've uh, really enjoyed our partnership with you and, and with the Latin Chamber of Commerce. So yeah, we have, we have shared vision. That's right. And we will continue that shared vision. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, see you later.